Welcome to APG Patshala. Today we are going to discuss the module Early Wittgenstein's View of Religion in the paper Philosophy of Religion and this module is written by Priyambada Sarkar of Calcutta University. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. One way of looking at Wittgenstein on religion is to acknowledge that his main contribution is in the field of logic, language, propositions and theory of meaning. In his two major works, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus and Philosophical Investigations, religion does not figure as a major theme. There are only four paragraphs in the Tractatus that refer to religion. Out of these four remarks, which are in 3.031, 5.123, 6.372 and 6.432, three are made in relation to making a point about logic. And there is only one remark which is relevant to religion, that is, God does not reveal himself in the world. It is there in Tractate 6.432. Apart from these, there are no substantial references to religion and religious views in these two works of Wittgenstein. But what is important to remember is that what he said about religion in his early writings is very very significant because it carried a lot of weight about what he said about religion so that's the reason why there is a need to look at what he said and then what are the various stages of his arguments even though these are not available in one particular place for early Wittgenstein, religion belongs to the domain of nonsense and about religious things one should not speak but should remain silent. Many people made the point that this is very similar to the logical positivist project of denial of metaphysics and religion. It is indeed is similar to the logical positivism. This position of uh, treating religion as belonging to nonsense made many people feel that he is similar to that of logical positivism. Rudolf Kolnap, one of the core members of logical positivism, acknowledged in his autobiography that he was strongly influenced by Wittgenstein's The Tractatus and said that this work made him, that is Carnap, to give up his earlier attitude of his live and let live attitude towards metaphysics and abandon the model of multidimensional universe and take up the cause of revolutionary positivism against the pseudo problems of metaphysicians. So you see the kind of impact what Wittgenstein said about religion had on Carnap. But we'll come to the more details where things get changed. So it is in this context we could say that Wittgenstein's views on religion and metaphysics are similar to that of logical positivist. Because both logical positivist and early Wittgenstein treated religion as nonsense. But the crux of the matter lies in looking at the meaning of the term nonsense that is used by Wittgenstein and that enormously and radically distinguishes him from the logical positivist. So at the first phase of the beginning of this discussion, both Wittgenstein and logical positivist are together in treating religion as belonging to nonsense. But then we'll see that there are radical differences between them and we'll come to it in a moment. But then before that, that Wittgenstein made a very important distinction, like logical positivist, distinction between the 
things that can be stated sensibly in language and that cannot be stated sensibly in language. That's a very important distinction. And then, according to Wittgenstein, the traditional metaphysicians have always succumbed to the mistake of conflating the distinction between what can be sensibly stated in language and what cannot be sensibly stated in language. So for Wittgenstein, it is necessary to maintain this distinction and he alleges that the traditional metaphysicians conflated this distinction. Wittgenstein stated in the preface of the book that philosophical problems only arise owing to the misunderstanding of the logic of our language. So for him, philosophical problems arise out of our misunderstanding of language. So for Wittgenstein, understanding the logic of our language is paramount important for philosophy. So for him, propositions that picture the state of affairs like scientific propositions are sensible propositions. So that they belong to the first one, but that is sensible propositions and non-sensible propositions. So scientific statements belong to the sensible propositions. There are sentences that do not, however, picture or represent the state of affairs. They don't picture the reality. And they, for a Wittgenstein, are pseudo-propositions. Pseudo-propositions is a word that actually led to a lot of misunderstanding. Many people read pseudo-proposition as a derogatory term, as a pejorative term. And you will know in a moment that it is not true. That Wittgenstein is indeed responsible for treating religious statements as pseudo-statements, pseudo-propositions. But before we go into that, let us look at what is a pseudo-proposition. A pseudo-proposition are those propositions that are senseless. And he brands, for instance, propositions of logic and mathematics as part of these senseless ones because they lack any reference and they are also not descriptive. They are abstractions and they don't picture any fact or event. So in this respect, Wittgenstein agrees with the basic tenets of logical positivism that what represents matters of fact are sensible propositions. But nonsense propositions are those that belong to ethics, aesthetics, religion and metaphysics and so on. So for Wittgenstein, saying what cannot be said makes them nonsense. That is, let us look at it very carefully. The point that Wittgenstein is saying is that there are certain things that cannot be said. Okay? Aesthetic statements cannot be said in language. Ethical statements cannot be said in language. Religious statements cannot be said in language. Metaphysical statements cannot be said in language. If you do say what cannot be said, that is the nonsense. So it is not that outside language, uh, uh, there are no things like, you know, out, outside the language. But if you designate what falls outside the language through language, that is what renders them nonsensical. In this respect, the tractate is in its complete accordance with the view of logical positivist. In fact, members of the Vienna circle also initially believed in it. Logical positivists regarded the Tractatus as the crystallization of their own anti-metaphysical doctrine. But Wittgenstein, as I said, differs from them in the following way. And this is what he said to his friend Ludwig Ficker. He said that nonsensical expressions are not so because I had not yet found the correct expressions, but that their nonsensicality was their very essence. So something is nonsensical because that is the essence of them. So he says that he wanted to go beyond the world and that is to say beyond the significance of language and found this to be just impossible. So there are certain things which are outside language and they cannot be designated through language. They can't be communicated through language. If you communicate those things through language, that makes it nonsensical. But then he says that there is a need to go beyond, but it is impossible for him. He found it very difficult to go beyond them. So for Wittgenstein, the non-sayable are not nonsensible, but saying what cannot be said, this activity renders the nonsense. 
so this is a problem regarding using language for purposes for which they cannot be used this is the point that we should not miss in discussing about wittgenstein on religion that if there are certain things that cannot be communicated through language and if you try to communicate that makes them nonsensical that does not make religion which is outside language nonsensical that's the important point here he wanted to emphasize that our words as we use them in sentence sciences are capable of conveying only facts and then he gives this beautiful example where he says as a teacup will only hold a teacup full of water even if i were to pour out a gallon over it so there are a lot of things but then you know language can take only that which can take what what it can take it can only take facts from science object to reality don't try to pour into it you know what it cannot take the better example would be that if i have a strainer in my hand and i want to hold the sea through it is it possible strainer by its very nature will not hold water so if i wanted to hold a, a, a sea or a river in the strainer it is not possible not able to hold the river or the sea in 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 the strainer does not make them non existent though i use it in a very figurative thing i'm just take it as a as an example as an illustration as a metaphor to drive the point that wittgenstein is to making so for wittgenstein his and other who tried to write about religion and ethics tried to run against the boundaries of language they tried to go beyond language and it was running against the wall of our cage this perfectly absolutely it's a hopeless situation it is just not possible to run against the walls of our cage which is language ethics as far as it springs from the desire to say something about the ultimate meaning of life and about the absolute good and about the absolute values can be no science at all so he does not accept that ethics can be science those people who try to bring you know scientific status to ethics or not accept this is not acceptable to wittgenstein he says that there are two different things so what it says does not add to our knowledge in any sense in other words what ethics says does not add to our knowledge it's constitutes of our existence but it is a document of a tendency in the human mind which i personally cannot help respecting deeply and i would not for my life ridicule them so even though i cannot express them i cannot say about ethics i have to respect it enormously i cannot ridicule please remember two important thing that is making he is saying that non sayability of religion non sayability of ethics does not make me to ridicule them on the contrary i should respect them in other words he is setting what can be called as the setting the boundaries of knowledge or limits of knowledge and he is saying that there is a tendency to trespass go beyond the language but it is not possible not only that once wittgenstein told mr drury a disciple of his and i quote don't think i despise metaphysics or ridiculate on the contrary i regard it as great later vienna circle realized that wittgenstein attitude to these nonsensicalities is completely different from those of logical positivist so in the beginning they were very ha happy that what wittgenstein said particularly rendering religious statements as nonsensical coincides with this project then the kind of status that he was trying to give a status which is much higher than the scientific statements made them realize that his view on religion is entirely different from theirs and that comes out in the following two ways so there are two aspects uh, you know that made um, uh, the point very clear that uh, wittgenstein differed from the logical positivist it is clear when there is a personal interaction wittgenstein had with uh, schlick in the summer of uh, uh, 1227 once when wittgenstein talked about the religion the contrast between his and schlick's position became strikingly apparent both schlick and wittgenstein agreed the view that the doctrine of religion in their various forms had no theoretical content 
that they agree. That's one thing that is common to both logical positivism and Wittgenstein and Slick and Wittgenstein. But Wittgenstein rejected Slick's view that religion belonged to the childhood phase of humanity. This is something which hurts Wittgenstein. It is not acceptable. This judgmental things about what lies outside language as pejorative or looking them down, Wittgenstein radically resisted. And he would slowly disappear in the course of cultural developments. This is the point that Schlick had. And then he said, no, Wittgenstein held the view that it is not you know, part of the childhood uh, aspects of humanity. And then it also will not disappear in the, in, in the course of human history. Further, the logical positivists also realized that they were totally mistaken in their interpretation of the, of the reading of uh, Tractatus. For instance, Carnap, one of the important persons in the school, reacted this when he said, and I quote, when we were reading Wittgenstein's book in the circle, I had erroneously believed that his attitude towards metaphysics was similar to ours. I had not paid sufficient attention to the statements in his book about the mystical because his feelings and thoughts in this area were too divergent from my mind. Only personal contact with him helped me see more clearly his attitude at this point. So you know very clearly that there is something you know, um, uh, defective or something wrong in the way in which the circle, Vienna circle, read Wittgenstein's Tractatus. They did not read it you know, as properly as they should have done and this confession reveals it substantially. His attitude, Karnak thinks, was that of a creative writer or a religious prophet. Look at this, that here is a person who seems to agree with logical positivist, who discarded, who rejected religion, and then now you see that his in his interaction with Slick, and then his, uh, you know, the way in which Carnap and others read uh, uh, Tractatus made them realize that he's just not only not re rejecting religion, he in fact treats it as one of the important domains. Let us look at this very important passage from Carnap and I quote, Wittgenstein's point of view and his attitude towards people and problems, even theoretical problems, were much more similar to those of the creative artist than those of a scientist. One might almost say similar to those of a religious prophet or a seer. When he started to formulate his views of some specific philosophical problems, we often felt the internal struggle that occurred in him at that very moment when finally his answers came forth, his statement stood before us like a newly created piece of art or a divine revelation." Unquote. So this is, reveals how, for instance, Wittgenstein not only differed from logical positivist, he had a radically different views on religion. So Wittgenstein linked his own religious ideas with those of Heidegger and Kierkegaard who are despised by logical positivist. Wiseman's conversation with Wittgenstein held on 30th December 1929, you know, reveals this particular thing. And let me just quote this. Again, a very important passage. In fact, it became one of the scandals, you know, within, the, uh, within those uh, Wittgensteinians in Britain. Let me quote Wiseman's statement. I can well understand what Heidegger means by being an angst. Human beings have a drive to run up against the boundaries of language. Think, for example, the astonishment that anything exists. This astonishment cannot be expressed in the form of a question and also there is no answer at all. All we can say can a priori be only nonsensical. Nevertheless, we dash ourselves against the boundaries of language. Kierkegaard also has seen this throwing of oneself and even described in a very similar way as throwing oneself against the paradox. So this passage shows for instance, how he is more sympathetic towards those like Heidegger and Kierkegaard who have been completely dismissed by logical positivist. So in fact, Wittgenstein had a lifelong interest in all these things of which one must be silent about. He said that wherever we cannot speak, thereof we have to keep uh, silent. 
That means the silence is not something that is limiting case. It is not something that is pejorative. It is something very noble and substantial. In 1930, while discussing Schlick's criteria of moral goodness, Wittgenstein stated that an action is good if it is what God wills. He chooses this criteria as superior to the rationalist criteria that a good action is good in itself and if God wills it, it is because it is good, not vice versa. So look at how, for instance, he has views about goodness and God, which are radically different from those like Schlick. So as far as his personal life is concerned, during the First World War, where he participated in the war, he was fascinated by Tolstoy's gospel in Brief, and he was also moved by the deeply religious attitude of Dostoevsky. During the war, Wittgenstein became friends with Paul Egelman, and Egelman states this, and I quote, the idea of God as a creator of the world's scarcely engaged Wittgenstein's attention. But the notion of the lost judgment was of a profound concern to him." Unquote. So Wittgenstein once told Drury, and I quote, I am not a religious man, but I can't help seeing every problem from a religious point of view. This makes us to really look at how there is a close relation between the logical concerns that preoccupied him and the mystical concerns that also concern him. Now, though this is not uh, the main thrust of this module, um, uh, uh, we will also discuss what Wittgenstein has to say about religion because there is a close relation between religion and ethics. We have noted earlier that Ethics and religion are intimately related in early Wittgenstein's thinking when he said, and I quote, if something is good, then it is divine. In a strange way, this sums up my ethics, is what, unquote. This is what Wittgenstein said. But if ethics is non-sayable and belong to the higher level, what does higher signify in this context? It is true that ethics cannot be communicated through language. It is not sayable. It is outside the boundaries of knowledge. At According to Wittgenstein, we have to accept it. But the question is, how do we access this? To answer this question, we can take up help from his lectures on ethics, where Wittgenstein distinguishes between rel relative value judgments and absolute value judgments. A relative value judgment is the one where the point that you make have a factual criteria. And it could be reducible to mere statements of facts. For example, if I say that she is a good orator, okay, and this value judgment have factual statements like she has got a command of the language, she knows the subject, she can express her points logically within a short period of time, she can make points in an appealing way, and she can make things clearly. All these things can be cited as reasons for saying that she is a good orator. So this is what is called as relative judgment. In contrast to that, there are absolute judgments of value for which there are no factual criteria. According to Wittgenstein, these absolute judgments go beyond any facts. Wittgenstein maintains that these judgments cannot be put into words. He says, and I quote, suppose one of you were an omniscient person, and suppose this man wrote all he knew in a big book then this book would contain the whole description of the world. And what I want to say is that this book would contain nothing that we would call an ethical judgment or anything that would logically imply such a judgment. It would, of course, contain all relative judgments of value and all true scientific propositions and, in fact, all true propositions that can be made. But all the facts described would, as it were, stand on the same level." Unquote. So what did he mean when he used expressions like absolute good? Let us take the example he gives both from the personal life. He says, it is a wonder that the world existed. It is another way of saying that it is a wonder that God created this world and I am in the world. To him, it is an experience par excellence and it is a mystical, hence cannot be put into words. Wittgenstein's offer another example while talking about the experience of feeling about absolutely safe. This means, he elucidates, I am safe, nothing can injure me, whatever happens. Here, the term safe is, you know, is tricky, as one cannot compare it to or contrast it with other words depicting the imminent danger from which one can claim to be safe. 
I can meaningfully say that I am safe in my room in the sense that leopards cannot attack me. But I cannot use the term safe while saying that I am always safe. So there is an absolute meaning and there is a you know, relative meaning. The third example which Wittgenstein cites is an experience of feeling guilty. Feeling guilty describes that God disapproves of, disapproves of our conduct. It is obvious that these examples of absolute value judgments are in fact indicative of religious experience though they cannot be demonstrated as facts. So now let us look at some very um, aphoristic like kind of statements Wittgenstein made in regard to the religion and mystical things. In Tractate 6.522 he says there are indeed things that cannot be put into words. They make themselves manifest. They are what is mystical. And Tractate 6.44 he says that it is not how things are in the world that is mystical but that it exists. In Tractatus 6.45, he says, to view the world subspecies, atirnim, is to view it as a whole, a limited whole. Feeling the world as limited whole, it is this that is mystical. So there are these, you know, remarks on religion, and we have mentioned earlier that these remarks on religions are scarce in the Tractatus, but some of them appear in notebooks of 1914 to 16 and let's look at them they are in the following what do i know about god and the purpose of life he writes in the notebook which is published in 1914 to 16 you know page number 73 and then he also goes on to say something about the world is problematic which we call its meaning to pray is to think about the meaning of my life and then he says to believe in god means to see that life has a meaning and the other point that he makes is God does not reveal himself in the world. So that means that God is outside the world. The quotation suggests that God is related to the meaning of life. As the meaning of life is something higher and not in the world, hence God as the meaning of the world cannot be in the world. So he is not inside the world, he is outside. Wittgenstein also speaks of the inexpressibility of God and religious experience. He says in Tractatus 6.432, how the world is, is for the higher, perfectly indifferent, God does not reveal himself in the world. So you know that his is to say in a, in a very soft way, his is a transcendental notion of God, not the eminent notion of God. In accordance with the theory of language and meaning, the Tractatus, God is not fact like other facts of the world. God is transcendental, hence outside the world. But there are many things which for Wittgenstein lies outside the world. So there are people like Cyril Barreto who says that what happens to those things that lie outside the world? Are they on par with God? Are they different? So it is so the point that one should keep in mind is it is true that Wittgenstein gives a very elevated status to those that lies outside. But those like God can be you know elevated but suppose if you have many things which are not in this world in the factual world but not on par with God that becomes a very problematic and there are no state for what answers in Wittgenstein to take up this problem thus God for Tractatus is not the traditional God or theologians in fact the Tractatus is a critic of traditional metaphysics and theological conception of God which claims that the existence of God can be proved by observations, factual reasoning. This is not acceptable to Wittgenstein. He says that those that lie outside the boundaries of language should not be, you know, communicated, should not be said. And the nonsense of this lies in this, not in God, but in, in trying to say things which cannot be said. He once said, I quote, it is dogma of the Roman church that the existence of God can be proved by natural reason. Now this dogma would make it impossible for me to be a Roman Catholic. So this is the point that he was trying to say. That giving rational justification for God is not acceptable to him. Because reason belongs only to this world. Language belongs to this world. And to take it outside and to designate those things that are outside is what 
makes them the activity nonsensical. So Wittgenstein draws a boundary on the limits of language. The tractator shows what lies on the other side of the boundary or the domain of values which include ethical, aesthetics and religious values. So let us just sum up uh, what we have discussed so far in, a, in, in the following way that Wittgenstein made the distinction between you know, sensical and nonsensical and he listed the scientific statements under the sensible statements and those that belong to religion, aesthetics, ethics, metaphysics under the nonsensical. But what to, to that extent at this level you see that there is a convergence between logical positivist and Wittgenstein. But Unlike logical positivist, he does not reject them. He treats them as belonging to the higher level. And that actually uh, is the one which has a serious impact on the subsequent philosophizing. And you see even people from continent like, you know, uh, Charles Taylor and others, you know, found their ally in the Anglo-Saxon tradition of analytical philosophy in the later Wittgenstein's writing. That's the very important contribution of Wittgenstein. Thank you.